Well, good morning, everyone. Bible says to be instant in season and out of season. That's even when the video don't work, right? So there we go. But we got a few quick announcements. We want everyone that is a married couple to attend the Enrich Retreat this year. Everybody say Enrich Retreat. We want everyone to attend that. You have the rest of this week, if you have not signed up, to do so. So please make sure that you sign up. The men's conference this year is March 10th and 11th, and uh, we want all the men to attend that. It'll be a great blessing for all the men of the church. And then our celebration of blessings, our annual service we do every year, uh, a.k.a. business meeting, where we review the church finances. We uh, will elect a new trustee this year. Uh, that is this Wednesday, so make sure you come Wednesday. Let's all stand this morning. And can we just enter into his courts with praise? Can we give him a hand clap of praise this morning? It's so great to be in the presence of the Lord today. Thank you, Jesus.
today. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Aren't you glad you know him today? Can we raise our hands one more time and just praise God for knowing my name and for loving me and for saving my soul? I love you, Jesus. I praise your name, God. You are worthy to be praised today. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You may be seated this morning. What an amazing presence of the Lord there is to be here in the house again. Despite electricity issues, we're here today. Isn't it great? <clears throat> Thank you, Jesus. I know that our uh, impressions team are getting ready to come and uh, take an offering this morning. I was reading in uh, Corinthians uh, 9 and 2, or 9 and 7, I believe it is, and it says that God loveth a cheerful giver. Well, I tell you, right now in this world, it's pretty hard to go anywhere and be cheerful about giving, isn't it? When's the last time you rolled up to the gas pump and filled up your car and started laughing? Ha, 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 $98 to fill that up. That was awesome. That was so great. That felt so good. I have not had that experience. I just haven't. Can anybody give me their best fake laugh this morning? Ha, 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 ha. Oh, that's great. Yeah, thank you, Brother Daffron. That's right. It, it is amazing how horrible this is. You go to go to McDonald's. I remember value mills were like a buck ninety-nine back in the day. Remember that? Dollar ninety-nine. And now it's like twelve bucks. You pull away from McDonald's and you still got that same gross, nasty cheeseburger. It's like what in the what a scam. What a ripoff, right? But I tell you, it is so great to know that when you are a cheerful giver for the Lord, it is not a waste, it is not a joke, and it is a blessing. Because when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he has done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah, praise God for saving me. I'm joyful today. Is anyone else joyful today? So think about all the goodness God has done for you. Think about all the times he has provided for you. And on those things, let's be cheerful today and give as God has rewarded us and blessed us today. You thought I was worth saving. So you came and changed my life. You thought I was worth So you cleaned me up inside You thought I was to die for So you sacrificed your life So I could be free So I could be whole So I could tell everyone I know You thought I was worth saving Thank you, Jesus So you
To save a wretch like you and me That's love That's love Jesus went Jesus went to chapters have been written. That's a perfect segue to my message today. It is so good to see everybody in the house of the Lord. Why don't you stand with me? We're going to read from the word of the Lord. We're going to honor this incredible oracle. It's good to see all of our guests. God bless you. We're so honored to have you. You have made our day joining us at the sanctuary. Sister Vinetta, so glad that you're back in service. And I missed Allie back there because she's so tall last week, but Allie was here last Sunday too. So glad to have her back in service. She's been through an awful lot. And my friend Andy is right here on the front row. Man, Andy, I'm so glad to see you guys today. God bless you. If you don't know Andy, this Andy runs the Narcotics Anonymous meetings in our basement and has for years. And you talk about faithful through COVID. It didn't matter if there was one or if there was 20, he's, he's here. And uh, I've noticed that and I appreciate that so much about you, Andy. He truly has a heart to help those escape that trap. I want to preach to you today this message, History is Written by the Victors. History is Written by the Victors. Who cares about the loser story? It's not so much that it is quite like that. Um, It's just a reality that The winners, they write the story in general. Before I do that, I know it was in the announcements, but go visit the table out here and help Jack Story get on his missions trip. Excited about him doing that. So turn with me to the first chapter of the book of Ephesians, and I'm going to tread on ground today that preachers sometimes dread. I'm going to mention a word that uh, a lot of confusion has surrounded. Ephesians 1.11 says, In him also we have obtained an inheritance. Being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things, according to the counsel of his will. Y'all know that God doesn't need any advice, right? His counsel, it'll do. I, I, 
I'm not going to counsel him. I need him to counsel me. Verse 12, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. There's this word that um, a lot of controversy, a lot of discussion, a lot of conjecture have been invested into the concept of predestination in the Bible. And I'm going to tackle that in just a very different way in just a moment. But pray with me for a second before we go. Jesus, we thank you. So thankful for your word. So thankful for your presence and your blessing and your strength. We ask you to help us for just a few moments. I want you to bless every person here with your word. What a powerful atmosphere has already been established through worship. Now, now let your word take its course. In Jesus' name. You can be seated. God bless you. And bless you for being here. My message is not about predestination today, but if you mention the word, you probably should explain it a little bit or there you'll uh, get all kinds of interesting responses probably. The concept of predestination in the Bible, predestination means destination already established. Destination set. You really hope that when you climb on a great big airplane and you're about to cross the giant Atlantic pond, that you are headed for the correct destination. Amen. Or it's going to be a really interesting trip. Because somewhere along about halfway across the Atlantic, you might figure out you're on the wrong plane. And whether you got a parachute or not, it is not time to disembark and change course. The concept of biblical predestination means that the church is predestined for heaven. Destination is already set. The concept applies to the church, not the individual. I used to sing a song when I was a boy about the good old gospel ship. Anybody old enough to remember that? <laughs> you just called yourselves old. But if you want to understand predestination, you, you can look at it like this. The ship is predestined. If you want to go where the ship's going, get on board. But the ship is going to heaven. You got a choice of whether or not you will be on board. That is predestination. If it came down to predestination at the individual level, it would violate the, the free will of humanity that God created us with. And if it violates the basic tenets of the Bible, then you know that your understanding of something is messed up. It's wrong. The church, the good old gospel ship is going to heaven. I encourage you to get on board. The concept of predestination, though, could also be viewed like this. Prof or history in reverse. I know where I'm going. It's already settled. Another word for history in reverse is prophecy. When the future is foretold before it has happened. I can tell you that the future of the church is foretold before it has happened. The, the, the church is the winning team. The Bible is a book that is full of history. 
And much of it comes in reverse order. Uh, much of it is prophetic. Uh, much of it describes uh, what will come. Uh, and then uh, it took place. Uh, many, I, I said this last week in, 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 a bio, in our Bible study on Wednesday night that uh, the, they say there's about 2,500 uh, prophetic uh, verses in the Bible or prophecies uh, and, and some 2,000 plus of them have already been fulfilled. There's still a few hundred waiting. But I'm going to tell you, if 2,000 have already been fulfilled, I'm going to say, you know what, I'll just wait on the others because God's word's going to be true. It's going to work out as he says. The ultimate prophecy for humanity, not just limited to the Bible or Christianity, the ultimate prophecy for humanity is this. The church wins. We are the winners. Those who have boarded the good old gospel ship, if you will, uh, are those uh, who are going to win. Uh, you, you, could, you could put it like this if you wanted. Uh, the church uh, is full of winners. There are no losers uh, in the church. Uh, you can play on a sports team and lose on occasion, but that really doesn't matter a whole lot in the scheme and in the scope of eternity. But in the scope of eternity, there are no losers in the church. This thing is made up of people who have indeed won because they joined a team that had already won, that has already established what is going to turn out. The church is going to be saved. The ship will Will arrive on the port of a crystal sea with pearly gates in view and people will disembark and enter in to the place of God's joys for eternity. The church will win. It's full of winners. I'm telling you today, if you're a part of the church of the living God, you are a winner. I don't care how many times somebody has told you uh, you're a loser. I, I don't care how many times you've lost on your team. Uh, you could be zero uh, and 20 this year, uh, and you're still a winner. Uh, I don't care how many times uh, that you've made financial mistakes, uh, and you look at the bank account, and you think, uh, I am a financial loser. Uh, you're a winner. Uh, amen. Uh, you're a winner uh, in the kingdom of God. There are no losers in the church. Mm. I don't care how long you messed up in your past. I don't care how many mistakes that you made when you were younger. I don't care how many times that, that you got yourself in messes. I don't care anything about the past. What I want to tell you today is when you climb on the ship, you're a winner. When you get on, the, in the, on board, you're a winner. When you join up with the church, you're a winner. Mm. The ultimate prophecy is that we win. Ha, ha, ha. We win. I don't like trash talk. It makes me want to close the mouth of the talker violently. especially when they're good enough to talk. That doesn't make it any better. I don't care how good you are. I still want to hit you. But if you'd be all right, I'm, every now and then I just like to gloat at the devil. I'm on a ship that you can't get on. I'm on a vessel headed for a destination that you can't go. And you may try to lure some folks off of it, uh, and I'll do my best to make sure that you fail. But listen, uh, the only thing that you can do for any solace uh, is to drag people off because you know you can't get on. Uh, you know you can't go on this thing. Uh, you've been there, uh, and you were booted out the door uh, because of your arrogance and your pride. Uh, and now in a little bit of suitable Holy Ghost pride, uh, I just want to tell hell, uh, you lose. Uh, you're a loser. Uh, you're the losers. Uh, we win. Uh, Mm. 
You know, there are African hunting companies. And they will offer you, I looked, looked some up, for a mere $5,900, you can go on a one-day lion hunt. That didn't include your plane ticket to Africa. And however you managed to get that deep into the bush, into the Sahara. And the matchup between the lion and a human with a gun is never good odds for the lion. Add to that the experience that the, no the knowledge of the guide whose job it is to make certain that that $5,900 price tag that the hunter bags his trophy. When the lion is killed, the guide will help load that carcass into the, onto the rack of their Land Rover or whatever they're driving. They'll cart it out of the wilderness. They'll take it to the taxidermist who plies his trade with chemicals and paint and steel rods and tools that take what was once an apex predator capable of killing any creature that it might encounter in its lifetime and converting it into a statue, a once proud. call is made on that day from the taxidermist to the hunter. Sir, your lion is ready for you to pick him up. He walks into the shop with his heart beating nearly as fast as the moment he pulled the trigger to take down that mighty trophy. Barely gets in the door before he stops dead in his tracks because before him on its feet as if stalking prey stands his lion. Beautiful, powerful. The muscles of that giant cat standing out seemingly flexed. The mane arranged as carefully on its neck. Eyes, though hollow and dead, seem piercing and almost haunting. He loads up his trophy and he takes it home. And he puts it on display to show it off as trophies typically are displayed. And that great beast then becomes exactly what the hunter wanted it to be. It is now a conversation piece. And over and over again, he gladly relates. He never grows weary of telling the story of the day of the hunt. He gives every detail about the flight to Africa. He talks about the plane, the turbulence, maybe that he experienced, the trip out to the Sahara, the accommodations of the hunting guide company, the beautiful lodge out in the middle of the desert. He gives the details of the breakfast he had on the morning of the hunt, the jitters that, that were in his stomach incessantly, his sweaty hands on the rifle that concerned him whether or not he'd be able to hold it steady when it came time to take the shot that his guides had guaranteed him he'd have. He describes the Land Rover, the dust colored paint with the rack on the back riding with the windows down across that dusty wilderness. He tells of the smells of the desert, the other wildlife they saw, the elephants lumbering along watching carefully after their young. He tells detail after detail after detail as they made their way to the territory of the lion pride. 
it relates to the stiffening fear of climbing out of that vehicle, knowing that he is now among the predators. And without his gun, he may not survive the day. And without being a good shot, this day could end badly. tells of looking through the field glasses and the spotting scopes and watching the lions from a distance, listening to their roars and the odd moans that lions make, sometimes communicating to each other. Then looking through the scope on his rifle, he builds the story all the way up. Hands that were shaking, he had to take deep breaths to finally calm himself. The guides whispering in his ear, it's okay, calm down. You're going to be all right. It's a straight shot. You got it. You, you've got him in your scope. Scopes, the scope is all already set. It's perfect. Just trust the scope. Pull the trigger. He tells of a shaking finger, wondering if his nervousness just might throw off his shot just that barely tiny little bit, but it's from such a distance that it can make all the difference. Slowly tightening his finger onto the trigger and the ringing blast of that rifle as it echoes across the desert. And suddenly that lion jumps into the air, attempts to run, doesn't get very far. The guides jump out of the bushes and the brush, screaming and flailing, chasing off all of the other lions, frightening them away so that they can, they can approach the one that he just shot finally get there and there's the carcass of a giant he describes walking up on it being stunned at the size of the paws on his feet and the mane and the head it was so much larger than what what uh, you would really ever imagine it, it was just a giant it was a it was it was a beast of a cat they load it up onto the back of the Land Rover and they head back to the lodge. And he tells this story with every detail that he can remember. And as hunters sometimes do, he may have added a few, <laughs> embellishing it a bit. Because hunters and fishermen never, never, the fish never gets longer over the years. tells his story with every detail he can remember. And all the while, the lion says nothing. He spends 20 minutes telling the story. He spends five minutes just focused on, on putting the gun on his shoulder and, and siding in and, and uh, that sweaty hand, those sweaty hands and that shaky finger pulling up uh, against uh, that, that trigger. He, he gives all these details and the lion stands motionless and, and says nothing. The lion doesn't roar in resistance. The lion does not moan. The lion does not flinch. Because the lion is dead, defeated, and now a trophy in the den of the one who was victorious. And the one who won is now writing the story because history is written by the victors. We're not sure who said it, but it is the statement that is common in historical study circles that history by the victors. Someone else said this, until the lions have their own historians, the history of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. And while it's not always true, in a very broad sense, it has proven quite correct over the ages of history that history is written by the victors. It's not written by the defeated. Their voices are drowned out by the shouts of victory. News cameras are not aimed at the sideline of the losing team. 
The losers are not interviewed midfield. It is the winning coach that is chased down by, by reporter after reporter. It is uh, the winning team star that is, uh, that is brought up on camera and interviewed. Uh, the losing team star, though he may be the MVP uh, for the entire season, uh, is let go to the locker room and, and nobody really stops him and talks to him because uh, history is wit written by the winning team. The stories of the winners are the stories uh, that are interesting. The victors write the books. The victors relate the stories. The victors tell of the battles. Uh, the defeated are silent because no one really wants to hear their story. God's word in so many ways is a historical account of humanity since creation. It's also a book of winners and losers. And isn't it amazing that even though you find God's people defeated multiple times throughout the Old Testament, it's still their story that shows up in history. It's still their story that shows up in the Bible. Even though they lost a battle, even though on multiple occasions they lost a war and were carted off into captivity into different nations and held there for decades, even though there were times when they lost time after time after time, yet it is their story that is written in the oracle of God's word. And the reason is because the people of God, even though we may go through down times and we may face struggles, it's still a fact that the people of God are are the winners. The people of God are going to win. The people of God, our story is going to be told on the day the trumpet sounds and so many are taken from this planet. There's going to be news reports and there's going to be newspaper articles and they're going to write about the people that disappeared. They're going to write the stories of those who are no longer here, what happened to them and why is their story being written? Because History is written about the winners. And the church is full of winners. The Bible is the best selling book in the history of mankind. There is no best selling book of hell. There is no best-selling book with the author, Satan or Lucifer. Because hell is defeated. And the winners write the story. The winners write the history. And before I was born, God was writing the history of the church. Before I was a gleam in my father's eye, the Lord was writing the history of the church. And when I was born, I was raised and I had the opportunity now. Will I make myself a part of the church? Am I going to climb on to the good old gospel ship whose destination is predestinated, whose arrival is guaranteed, who's one day going to dock in the port of heaven? Am I going to join up with that team or will I live my life as the loser. No, I made up my mind a long time ago. If there's a winner, I want my story written on the winning team. I want the tales told of what I did on the winning team. I want to be one of the ones writing the history of this church, of the things that God has done, of the miracles that he has wrought, of the mighty victories that have been accomplished. Even on the days when it's hard and when I fail, I can go running back and guess what? I'm still a part of the church and I'm still a winner. History is written by the winners. I want the pen of history in the hand of my, my hand so that I can write my own story as victorious. It's the victors that write the stories. And surely... We 
just need to stop for a second. I wonder if you just stand to your feet and lift your hands with me for a moment and just worship the Lord. I'm winding down. You can just remain standing. God, we worship you. I'm so thankful that you gave us the opportunity to live as the winning team. I'm so thankful that you gave us the opportunity to walk in your spirit and walk in your presence, to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, be transformed in this world. I'm so thankful. Surely the greatest illustration of history being written by the victor is the cross of Calvary where God won unequivocally without debate the undisputed winner for all eternity because he won he writes the stories and he has continued to write the stories. We read that they took him down off the cross and they buried him in a tomb that Joseph of Arimathea had purchased for himself. But he didn't need the tomb long. He only needed it for a weekend. We read that he exited that tomb without rolling away the stone. Angels had to remove it for people to see him, but I don't think Jesus needed a, a stone removal team. He spent a few weeks being seen of those that he loved that had loved him. He gathered his team one last time. He told them, go wait in Jerusalem because there's a new chapter of history about to be written about the winners. And then he was taken. The flesh left the earth. Fifty days later, place called the upper room the Holy Ghost fell for the very first time there is no book from Satan about the cross why write about your defeat there is no book from Satan telling I almost won all you hear are the impish whines and cries from the depths of hell of he must have cheated because we killed him. God, you cheated, uh, brought the flesh back to life. That's not fair. I have never heard a winner who was worried about fair. I've seen plenty of winners uh, who overcame cheaters. That's not right. Hell doesn't write that story. Hell doesn't talk about that. Hell doesn't, doesn't care to relate that story because uh, they lost. Satan lost right there in that arena. But Jesus wasn't just writing his story of victory. He was writing my story of victory. He was not just writing his story of winning in the arena of the eternal. He was writing my story of being able to be a winner in the ring of the eternal. He was not just writing about how God in the flesh conquered. He began to write the story of the untold millions and even billions who have now made their way to Calvary, who have found that the blood still washes every stain, who have found that being filled with God's spirit is transforming and gives you a whole new destination and you climb on a good old gospel ship that was predestined to make the port of heaven one day and we know the church wins. Now it's time to start writing your own 
history as the victor because history is written by the victors. The book of Revelation mentions several times something called the book of life or the Lamb's book of life. You know what it is? It's the record of the winners. It is the place where the names are written down of those who have accepted the washing of the blood. It is the place where the names of those are written down who have sought and been filled with his spirit until overflowing And he begins to speak through them. God writes the names of those uh, who uh, have accepted uh, his plan for their lives in the Lamb's book of life. It's a record of those uh, who have won the race that the Apostle Paul uh, described as his life was wrapping up. Uh, And I want you one day to be able to relate your story as the winner. Uh, I want you one day to be able to relate your story as the one uh, that climbed on the ship uh, and realized uh, my eternity is settled. Uh, I know where I'm headed. I know where I'm going. I want you to be able to pick up the pen of eternity and write the story of the day the first time I felt his presence. The day, the first time that I lifted my hands in surrender. That moment, the first time I stepped into an altar and began to pray, God, I want you to forgive me of my sins. I want you to change the course of my life. I want my eternity to be settled and I want it to be settled in the blood of Jesus that was said so that I could be here on this day. I want to have in my hand the the instrument of history and write it as the winners. The winner. Can we pray, Lord, in Jesus' name across this room? There are people, people right here, right now that desperately need you to whatever experience they have with you, Lord, you're drawing them to something more today. You're, there's such a magnetic attraction to your presence and your spirit in this room even right now. Somebody needs to write the, the beginning of a brand new chapter as a winner today. I don't know what your story is today. I don't know what it is to this point, but I know what it can be from this moment forward. I don't know what your story looks like. I don't know how sad it is. I don't know how bad it is. I don't know how desperate it is. Or I don't know uh, how, how wonderful it may have been. I know this, uh, that walking without the Spirit of the Lord in your life uh, is a pretty miserable experience as a human. I don't, I don't know how far you came. I don't know how many mistakes you've made. I don't know uh, how, how, how bad it looks when you look back across the landscape of time of your life, but I know that today everything can change. And I believe the Lord is drawing people. Sanctuary, I'm going to ask you to do this. We, we always step into this altar as a church. I'm going to ask you to, to step into the altar today and lift up your hands. And if nothing else, thank the Lord. But maybe there's someone with you or by you. Maybe they just need an invitation. Would you like to pray today? Would you like to test out the winning side? Would you like to know more about what pastor is preaching about today? The Holy Ghost is drawing folks. So right now, could we, as a church, could we just create a way forward into this altar? Come on, sanctuary. The Lord is drawing people. Make it easy for them today. Step into the altar. Just lift your hands and begin to worship him. Thank him for the opportunity to be on the winning side. And friend, if you're here today, you're not part of the sanctuary. You're not joining this church if you step into the altar to pray today. We just want to give you the opportunity to get closer to the one who died for you. We we want to just give you the opportunity to step into the presence of the almighty God who is drawing you and reaching for you, whose name he, he is calling you. It's time to switch from the prey to the predator. It is time to leave the losing and join the winning. It is time today to have a whole new direction in your life. That can take place. History is written by the victors. It's time to pick up the pen and begin to write.
just story. From this day forward, it's a different story. From this day forward, it's not the same anymore. It is the story of a winner. It is the story of one who, who is headed for a victory in heaven. It is the story of one who is determined to make it to But my story used to be uh, as a loser. My story used to be I was uh, I was losing every hand. Uh, I lost. Uh, no one knew it. I kept a straight face. Uh, I didn't let it show very easily. Uh, but uh, my story used to be uh, I lost everywhere it turned. Uh, I lost. I lost. I lost. I lost. Uh, but now uh, you're saying I have a chance. Uh, you're saying I have the opportunity to change the losing to, from losing to winning. You're saying that I have the opportunity to have joy and peace that I can leave behind that history of becoming the prey of Satan and I can become the victory of heaven. Sign me up. Get me there. I want to be on the winning side. I want to be on the winning side. some stuff uh, underneath the layers of your Christianity uh, that need to come out into the open in the presence of God. I don't mean you need to tell somebody. I need, mean you need to have a conversation with the Lord. God, it's time for me to stop losing right here. It's time for me to start winning. <laughs>